that I'm going to give. And um, I think we're still going to be able to do the whole thing. Um, yeah. Um, you know, the first one, the first one of these things is always a little rough. But anyway, so thinking about this past year, um, I don't know about you, but I probably in my 58 years of life wrote more about gender, history, race, the environment, anger. And I've always kind of written about those things, but I think I felt them more keenly and I try to write them, to write in them more directly. And what I discovered was that a lot of times when I was dealing with these topics, I would end up just kind of like, it's like um, pushing them around on my plate in the same shape and having a really hard time um, reframing them or making them fresh or making them into a poem that I would want to read again, let alone anybody else would want to read more than one time. You know, there's something about those topics that encourage you to write in a blurt, but that poem is the kind of thing that really doesn't invite people to return to and contemplate. And so um, for the purposes of this talk, I decided to um, return to some really basic advice that I remember from poetry workshop. It applies to all genres. And I'm going to show you three examples. And because um, they're examples that we can hear and consider in the short frame of this talk, they're poems, but for the purposes of this next 50 minutes or so, 45 minutes, I want you to think about genre distinctions in these ways, okay? So, and I'm borrowing these distinctions from somebody named Louis Turco, who wrote a book, a tiny little book that's really awesome called The New Book of Forms. So the way he thinks about genre distinctions, and of course we all know that these distinctions, like many other distinctions in culture, have gotten very blurred and all the boundaries have been breached. But for the purposes of, like I say, the next 45 minutes, fiction tells a story using character, plot, atmosphere, theme. In other words, fiction is the art of narrative, okay? Fiction writers, accept that? All right. Essay or nonfiction explores an idea using a subject, thesis, argument, conclusion. The art of rhetoric. And I realize that often memoir is really the story of self or, or more accurately, the story of how self changed. But in terms of essay, like the classic idea essay it explores an idea. And finally, now, the author of this little book of forms is a poet, so of course he's going to make poetry the most essential. Um, for him, poetry is the art of language. It pushes language to do things that language doesn't normally do in everyday discourse. So, Oftentimes, like contemporary lyric poetry, sometimes it acts like visual art. It shows you a picture. Sometimes it acts like music. It gives you sound, okay? But it's using language. Did, did something happen? Okay. Are you, all, are you all there on Zoom? Yeah, okay, good. Something just made a sound and put a box on the screen here. We will ignore it. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give you a poem right now. I'm gonna read you a poem that is really fiction. It's really a work of fiction. Um, this poem tells the story of a relationship between a man and a woman who come from different racial backgrounds, 
It's written by the poet I, capital A, I, who was an important force in the Black arts movement in the 70s. Um, I's name was chosen and it means love in Japanese. She identified as Japanese, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Black, Irish, Southern Cheyenne, and Comanche, and typically wrote dramatic monologues, um, typically in the voices of other people, not herself. I mean, she's very interesting. Um, she died in 2010 at the age of 62. So I'm gonna tell you that I'm not assuming that the speaker of this poem is the author and I want to acknowledge that there's a problematic nature of me reading it in the voice of the speaker of the poem, because this poem is about race and it's spoken in the voice of a black woman speaking to a white man. Um, and I think this is an important question. It's not in the frame of this talk to discuss, but if you want to talk with me about these kinds of problematics of representation and re-representation, I'm going to sit at a table on the porch at lunch and we can talk about that because it's it's going to be throughout this talk. Um, also, I think it might be an appropriate thing to write in your journal about for today if it's something that strikes you. Okay, here's the poem. Woman to man. Lightning hits the roof, shoves the knife, darkness deep in the walls. They bleed light all over us and your face, the fan folds up. So I won't see how afraid to be with me you are. We don't mix, not even in bed where we keep ending up. There's no need to hide it. You're snow, I'm coal. I've got the scars to prove it but open your mouth. I'll give you a taste of black you won't forget. For a while, I'll let it make you strong, make your heart lion, then I'll take it back. Okay, fiction. We have character, two characters. We have plot, we have an atmosphere, danger, fear, we have a theme, power, oppression, craft tip, applicable to all genres. Theme or idea can be set by the rhyming of images. So in poetry, we talk about rhyme and we mean the repetition of sound, but you can also repeat images like light, dark, snow, coal, white, black. These all come up in this poem. And the title, woman, man, right? So she's setting up these oppositions. It's the 1970s. It may or may, she may or may not be questioning the oppositions. And I want to ask you, as you think about this, think about just right now, think about three impossible topics with political implications that you've been trying to write about this past year. By impossible, I mean hard to get hold of with your language. Just write them down, don't think too hard. So everybody got them? Okay, circle one of those three. And now, again, without thinking too hard, think of images, stuff. By that, by image, I mean pictures in your mind. I mean stuff in the world that are related to that topic, but not necessarily to one another, just to the topic and just make a list. 
concrete stuff in the world that some have something to do with your topic. Yeah, as, as, as you see it in your mind. If you've got details, put them down, catch them. And I'm going to give you a couple more minutes. Well, I'll give you one more minute and then we'll move on. So if there are things that are coming to you, make quick make notes so you can come back to it. Okay, the next poem I want to share with you acts like an essay. It's an essay poem. Um, and the title of the poem, Trophic Cascade, is a technical term that has to do, um, it's with an ecological phenomenon that is triggered by the addition or removal of the top predator in um, a biosphere, okay? So in this case, the poem has to do with what happened when they reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone Park. This poem is written by Camille Dungy. She's a contemporary African-American poet. The title of the poem is also the title of her recent book, 2017 book. Um, and I've asked Nicole to read it because she is working on writing nature poetry um, and as she gets ready to read, I just want to say in doing that, I'm not eliding the fact that um, Dungy herself is an African-American woman, rarely, you know, usually not associated with nature writing as a type of person. And so when she says, don't tell me this has nothing to do with me in the poem, it has special resonance because of her particular identity. But and it also, I think, applies more generally, as you'll hear, to the sort of surprising turn that the, the, the poem, what I'm calling an essay, takes at the end. Okay, Nicole, let's hear it. In their upreach, songbirds nested, who scattered seed for underbrush. And in that cover, worn snowflake hair, weasel and water shrew returned, also whole. And so came soon hawk and falcon, bald eagle, kestrel, and with them hawk shadow, falcon shadow, Eagle shade and kestrel shade haunted newly buried realms where deer no longer rummaged, cautious as they were now of being surprised by wolves. Berries brought bears, while undergrowth and willows growing now right down to the river brought beavers, whose dam muskrats came to dams and tadpoles came to that night song of fathers of tadpoles 
With water striders, the dark gray American dipper bobbed in fresh pools of river and fish stayed and the bear who fished also pulled deer ponds and to their kill straps came vulture and coyote, long gone in the region until now, and their scat scattered seed and more trees, brush and berries grew up along the river that had run straight and so flooded, but thus damned, compelled to meander and less prone to overrun. Don't you tell me that this is not the same as my story, as this life born from one hungry animal this whole new landscape, the course of the river changed. I know this. I reintroduced myself to myself, this time a mother, after which nothing was ever the same. So did you get that? She's also doing what poets do. I mean, in addition to doing, setting forth an argument as in an essay, and then providing all the evidence, nonfiction, she's also creating a metaphor in that final turn where the reintroduction of the wolves to Yellowstone is similar and different from, which is what a metaphor does, similar and different from myself becoming a mother. Um, Robert Lowell said, don't write about an experience, create an experience for me, writing your poem. And the only way to do that that I know, I mean, there are other ways, but the only way to do that that I know as a lyric poet, I'll qualify it, is to say that you've got to write something as concretely and in as much detail as possible, be a witness in the world and show your personal stakes in the matter. But see, see what she does with her personal stakes. She waits to the very end in that poem. We're writing literature, not journalism. We're writing things we want people to come back to and read again, not things we want them to read for information and then throw away, which is what happens with newspapers, throw away or click to the next thing. So here is what I want to ask you to write about. What is your personal encounter with that difficult, impossible to write about challenging topic? What is your personal encounter? Free right to describe that. And you know what, it could be really small.
about one or two more minutes. Okay, make notes. Is there st stuff you don't want to miss or lose? And finally, I want to share a poem with you that acts like a poem. Um, this is one of my favorite poems. It was published in 2006. Um, it's the House of Beauty, so the title of the craft talk is borrowed from this poem. Um, it, the House of Beauty is burning. When I hear that phrase, I think of uh, climate change and environmental activists, right? But this is actually about the arson in a beauty parlor in New Jersey, okay, about. That's the topic. It's not really what it's about. Um, it, it uses repetition. It uses all kinds of sonic devices like internal rhyme. It uses a kind of hypnotic pattern in which in each stanza, the final line repeats and an additional line is added. So the poem grows in a kind of like a, a, a nursery rhyme way. Um, and it's written by Mark Doty, who's a contemporary American poet um, who became, and essayist really, he's, he's equally an essayist, who became uh, well known and really his career began um, when he was writing about the AIDS epidemic and life in New York. Um, and he lost his first life partner to AIDS. House of Beauty. In Jersey City, on Toneal Avenue, the House of Beauty is burning. On a Sunday morning in January, under the chilly shadow of the Pulaski Skyway, the House of Beauty is burning. Who lobbed the fire bottle through the glass, in among the creams and thrones, the helmets and clippers and combs? Who set the House of Beauty burning? In the dark recess, beside the sink where heads lay back to be laved. Under the perfected heads rode along the walls, the hopeful photographs of possibility darken now that the house of beauty is burning. The skyway beetles in the ringing cold, trestle arching the steel river and warehouses, truck lots and Indian groceries, a new plume of smoke joining the others, billow of dark thought rising from the broken forehead of the house of beauty. An emission almost too small to notice just now, the alarm still ringing, the flames new launched on their project of ruining an effort at pleasure jagged glass jutting like cracked ice in the window frame, no one inside, the fire department on the way. All things by nature, wrote Virgil, are ready to get worse. No surprise then that the house of beauty is burning. Though whatever happens, however far these fires proceed, reducing history to powder, whatever the house of beauty made is untouchable now. Nothing can undo so many heads made lovely or at least acceptable. So much shapelessness given what are called permanence, 
Though nothing holds a fixed form, bring on the flames. What does it matter if the house of beauty is burning? Propose a new beauty, perpennially unhoused, neither the lost things nor the fire itself, but the objects in their dresses of disaster, anything closed in its own passage, padded vinyl chair bursts into smoky tongues, lucite helmet sagged to a new version of its dome, our black bridge a charred rainbow on iron legs, two ruby eyes glowering from its crown. If beauty is burning, what could you save? The house of beauty is a house of flames. Craft tip, which seems entirely to contradict the last one, Write about something only vaguely associated with your subject or not associated with it at all, right? How is a beauty parlor arson in New Jersey related to the destruction of the gay community through the AIDS epidemic? Well, there's all that you know, drag, big wigs, there's like spectacular dressing. I mean, you can make a connection, but it's remote, right? In revision, you can drop hints, but as the dis for the discipline of this suggestion, write about something that is removed from the topic are only associated through some kind of an imaginative leap like that and see what happens. Make a list right now of things that are small, that are incidental, that are not really related to your topic, but so that somehow come to your mind right now. And then just add some stuff that you know isn't related. <laughs> because your unconscious is way smarter than you are. So just throw it out there. If you've, um, and yeah, give, give yourself a minute to conclude or just throw in something weird. And if, especially if you're a nonfiction person or if you're somebody who um, is interested in art history, I, I recommend. little book called Still Life with Lemon and Oysters. Um, it's exquisite, it's beautiful. And the many of the ideas in that book are 
he points to in the final stanza of this poem, propose a new beauty, neither the lost things nor the fire itself, but the objects in their dresses of disaster, anything clothed in its own passage. He's talking about mortality there, right? Um, I also think when I said drop hints, I think in this poem, when he says, I, I, I really feel that this, this poem is a way of refusing homophobia and transphobia. It's an attempt to rise above hateful violence that aims at one of the lines in the poem, ruining an effort at pleasure and the destruction he represents with the quote, charred rainbow. Like there's a charred rainbow in this poem, which is, you know, incredibly emblematic. And who, how could anybody get away with that? You, you wonder, because it feels like it's even bordering on cliche. And yet he pulls it off because he stays grounded in all these exquisite details of this apparently unrelated topic. So that's, that's kind of just the point I'm making. Um, I invite you to look up Mark, Mark Doty, D-O-T-Y, and House of Beauty on YouTube. Um, he reads it beautifully. And when you get the slides from this talk, you can compare, you can look at the text of the poem in the slide and his reading, and you'll realize that the reading was an earlier draft of the poem. And it's always fun to see and to contemplate the decisions that people make um, in revision. Okay, now we have about 15 minutes left. And my thought is, if this, I know it's like day one, who wants to do this? But my thought is to, to invite you to look around and I will figure out, I don't know how this could happen on Zoom. Sheila and I will confer and we'll figure out how. So hang in there folks on Zoom, I'm looking at you. Um, look around and find one person in this room you would like to talk with. And what I'd like to ask you to do are these things. I know, right? I, I feel so like an anarchist. You would do this anyway, but what I'm suggesting is that we'll take a couple minutes for you to look back over your notes. And if something is interesting to you, and don't think about, don't think too hard about why it's interesting. Just something is interesting, underline it, and then choose one person in this room you trust, get together with them, and these are the things. Share, so one, one person starts, share. Listen, thank them for sharing. Praise what you hear. There's something in there that's praiseworthy. Ask a question about it and thank them for the conversation, right? I mean, you know this, but I thought it's like a reminder of how to behave because we've all been locked up for so long. <laughs> okay? So let's just take like two minutes for you to look back over. Is there something in there that is interesting? And I've got to tell you that I think um, disembodied from your memories and whatever it is that led you to choose that topic, this might be vulnerable making, but it, it might not. And actually sharing one little piece of it 
And the person responding with a question that might come to you seem like completely out of left field because they don't know your context, that might be the most useful thing of all. Because I'm back to like pushing the same crap around on your own plate, right? And being stuck in the same, using your own language. And that's really the goal here, is to, to find new possibilities for writing about what you care about the most, okay? So just look through, underline what interests you, and then maybe just make eye contact. And I don't know how this is gonna work, honestly, but I think you'll, you'll see someone and you'll be like, you. I'll do this with you. Okay, they are gonna do it through private chat. Okay, good. And they suggested that themselves. Excellent. Okay. I'm gonna mute us. Here, the din in here. Um, we're about to go up to lunch. So thank you for the work you've done. And I hope this is useful to your writing and thinking. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.
welcome people. <laughs> we're gonna send out the, wait a second. Hi, we're gonna send out the um, slides that were to, supposed to accompany this to, to you all. Um, we'll also put them in Brightspace, but I'll have Joe send us an email as well. Um, please check in with me if you have any issues or concerns about the tech thing. Thanks again for your patience. We're gonna work through this. I bet it gets smoother as we go, okay? Thumbs up. All right, Lori Morenci, I'm gonna talk with you. I'm gonna send you an email about tonight's keynote, okay? Yes? All right, bye gang.